Hey guys, welcome back to Fat Man Little Trail, the podcast, the podcast where everyone is welcome on the trail. I'm your guide today, Greg. Uh, hopefully this is going to be a great episode and I'd like to welcome in all those new, uh, listeners that are on Amazon music and audible. We are now available on those platforms as well. Uh, so welcome to all of those people, uh, to listen in, uh, I sure hope that you guys like this and I know it's going to be a great episode. So go ahead and like, and share uh, as much as you can on your platforms. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Facebook as well. And you'll get more updates on my content. Uh, If you'd like to support the podcast, you can also check the link in my bio, even 99 cents a month uh, is very helpful for a guy uh, like me to bring you more and more of this content. I want to get right into my chewing the fat segment this week and my guest this week is a friend of mine, actually, so this should go well. Kristen McGetrick is a, has a doctorate in physical therapy with added certificates in strength and conditioning and tactical strength and conditioning, and she is an avid outdoor enthusiast and climber, I know. Uh, she rec- recently completed two more of Colorado's iconic 14ers, bringing her total to four. Is that correct, Kristen? You are correct. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. Before we get into your outdoorsy lifestyle here and what you like to do, let's go back a little bit. Were you athletic um, growing up? Were you always kind of an athlete? I was. I was never the best, but I started swimming when I was four and swam all through high school for a competitive team. And then also through high school, I played tennis, lacrosse, and swam for my high school team. Um, When I got to college, I joined the crew team. So I was a rower for one year and then I was the coxswain for a year and a half after that. My senior year, I swam club swimming. So I have done something at least every year since I was four. Wow. And once you got out, well, first of all, I have a follow up to that. The cox, what is it? It's the person that just yells and screams, right? It is. Yes. That's what I thought. Okay. And that (laughs) that seems, that seems fitting for you. Um, (laughs) So once you got out, you started doing like triathlons and things like that as well and competitive um, races and things like that, right? I did. I, once I got to grad school, I started running more and I would run a couple 10 Ks, 10 milers a year. I have done 10 of the army 10 miler races, which has been awesome. And I've done a couple of the cherry blossom ones. And now I'm starting to do them out here as well. Um, they're fun. They're hard, but I like them. Well, needless to say, you are in much better shape than I am as a guy who just <laughs> slowly walks along the uh, trails. Um, but as an e, because you grew up on the East Coast, right? And you went to college out on the East Coast and things like that. I did. So yes. as an East Coaster, but still being an athletic person, when you came out to Colorado in that higher altitude, did that actually make a big difference in your in your training and your competing? You said you're starting to compete out here now. I, it did. I had to humble myself with slower times and sometimes needing to walk on my runs. It's not as easy, a lot hillier than it is in DC for sure. So there has been a big transition and a lot of humbling. I am feel like even though I've been here for just over two years, I am still trying to get myself back to where I was before. But you've done you've done some really cool stuff. Like when did you climb your first 14 or if you've been out here for two years? My first 14 or was probably the spring of 2020. Which do you remember which one that was? Oh yes. It was Pike's peak and it was quite challenging. That's a long one. That's a a tough one to start on. It was 14 hours. Wow. Tell me about it. So I think, gosh, we started at like three 30 in the morning and I had decided that my stomach hurt right when I started. So eating and drinking was not a top priority, which unfortunately made me start out very poorly and did my best. I made it to the top and felt miserable the entire time. And then even on the way down, nothing changed with the altitude difference. I still felt pretty terrible, but I got to the bottom and kind of felt like Forrest Gump a little bit. I had a lady ask if we had just done the whole thing. And I was like, we did. And now I need to sit down. So <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> and it was, but now every time I look at the mountain, it, it's pretty awesome to see that that's the first 14 or that I climb. I live at the base of it now. So it's pretty cool. I see it every day on my commute to work. So do, do you climb it every day then? 
I don't. I look <laughs> at it every day and remember that I climbed it, but I don't think I will climb up and down again. That is one of the fun things is, you know, once you start climbing mountains is as you're driving like down the I-70 or something like that. And you're like, whoop, did that one, did that one, did mm-hmm. that one. It's a fun little, little game. So you wrote a, you wrote a um, guest blog on, on my website on fatmanlittletrail.com about your trip. And you actually said that you, you got kind of emotional on it and, and, and you may have been brought to tears a little bit. Um, I think the tears were from the pain that I was feeling. I, by three miles from the bottom, I, my brother had called me and he, I was like, look, man, I'm, I'm on a mountain. I just slid down a rock and started crying. And I was, don't even know why I cried, but I did. And I, I don't even know what happened. I was so glad to be over <laughs> It really just takes a physical and mental toll on you. Just being, mm-hmm. you know, one, three thirty in the morning is terrible. Two, hiking for I would I think it's like fourteen miles, you know, like up uh, or something like that. it's like eight miles up and then eight miles back or something. Some crazy. I wish it was twenty four and a half miles round trip. Okay, so oh, so you started at the bottom, bottom. We you didn't did. Do, you didn't do one of those fake ones. So just mm-hmm. just hiking twelve miles up the side of a hill is just emotionally and physically draining, and of course since you didn't eat or drink, uh, you were probably, you know, your body hated you that much more than it usually hates you. Absolutely. Um, as, as a, as a trained medical professional, would you suggest not eating and drinking before doing a 14er? I would absolutely not do anything that I did on the 14er. <laughs> Again, I have learned my lesson. I, we stop about every hour for five minutes for a rest with some food and some water always bringing a change of socks to make sure our feet are in good shape. And, um, once we get to the top, we always, well, first you have to have a summit Snickers. So mm, everyone absolutely. needs one of those and a lunch and, or something as a snack before we head back down. So now I, I definitely do better than I did the first time I've learned my lesson that that is not the way to go. And now I bring lots of snacks and well, lots of water. And that segues perfectly. So Pike's Peak was about a year and a half ago, roughly. Yes. And so when did you do Grays and Tories? Um, we just did that last month, actually. Okay. So it's pretty recent and way better than of an experience. Definitely an easier, easy hike, not something too crazy, but I was way more prepared. And do you, so, so would you say that was the important part? Like, once you do your first 14 or you kind of know what you're looking, looking at for your next 14 or, or do you think it was just the difference in mountains that made it easier? I think I knew what to expect. We did Mount Princeton in between um, Pikes Peak and then Grays and Tories. And I thought I kind of knew what to expect, but there was definitely more rocks and my fear of heights got the best of me as I was climbing down on, on rocks. Again, not super crazy of a hike, but it was... That was, that was my emotional toll was on that one. It on was Princeton on Princeton coming down on the rocks. I started scooting on my butt and then I got reprimanded because it's unsafe. And That's... so I, now I'm not as scared once I've done it once, at least I feel a little more confident knowing my shoes will hold me and I'm not going to hopefully tumble, you know, 14,000 feet down. As as the fat man, everybody's like, "Oh, why don't you climb? You can get on ropes and stuff." And I'm like, "Do, do you really think a rope's going to hold this?" You know, and I know <laughs> I know you should believe in the ropes and you trust in the ropes and your equipment and all that, but there's still like, I'm not a skinny climber. I'm a I'm a I'm a hefty hiker, so I don't really trust <laughs> trust in the nylon there. I, I I will say you talked about your fear of heights. I did uh, Mount Beerstadt when I was before I'd gained all the weight, before I had my injury, and I did climb Mount Beerstadt, and I was in great shape at the time, and what I realized was that I am terrified of heights and I kind of knew I was scared of heights and I didn't realize it until I got to the top of Mount Beerstadt and everybody's up there celebrating, jumping around, bouncing around. And I'm sitting there holding on to this rock for dear life, just like clinging to it. My friend's like, Oh, come on. Don't you want to take a picture? I'm like, no, what do you want to do? I'm like, go down. We need to go down right now. We need to go. I started screaming at him. I started screaming at people that were coming up and then I got down like a hundred feet and I was like, Oh no, I'm good. You know? And I just went back to normal. So, so like, I get what you're saying when you get up onto those situations where you're like, Oh my, you know, this doesn't feel safe or, you know, you're uncomfortable and how your body just like does, it goes kind of goes into survival mode where it's like, well, nope, I'm going to sit on my butt and I'm going to slide. I, I don't care anymore. <laughs> you know? Yep. And that's exactly what happened. And it, 
it took a minute for me to feel better. I do. Um, I did start down the anxiety attack road and was able to kind of breathe myself out of it, but you know, having, having someone be like, you got to move, you got to move. And I'm like, I just need a moment. <laughs> Let me get my feet underneath me. So it was a good learning experience. I think for both of us Absolutely. about how to deal with that. Well, so a couple of weeks ago, I talked to meteorologist Matt Makins about how to stay safe in the weather when you uh, go and hike these 14ers. And one of the important things is, you know, spotting bad weather and making sure that you're off the mountain by, by you know, noon and things like that because of the, the storms. And then I saw pictures of you when you hiked Grays and Tories, and uh, you didn't take any of that advice from the podcast, no, I did didn't. you? What no. was the what, what was the weather like when you did graze and tories? Um the night before there were some pretty epic thunderstorms. Um there were threats of thunderstorms the next day. Um luckily my better half is very well trained on mountain climbing. So I trusted his judgment that we were going to be okay and he told me that I got to, you know, put on my big girl pants if he says we got to go down now and run down the mountain. But we kept an eye out on the weather and started at 4, 4.45 in the morning and got to the top. There was some cloud coverage and it all broke and it was one of the most beautiful sights I've ever seen. The pictures Would I do stunning. it again knowing that there was a horrible potential of thunderstorms? Maybe, <laughs> probably shouldn't. <laughs> well, you were safe and that was the important part. and. And the storms, I think, because I remember the day you did it, and we did have bad storms the night before. Mm -hmm. um, but the next day it did, it broke up and it became absolutely beautiful. But your height or your pictures from there, like you're above the clouds looking down. And it, I mean, yep. it was, it was beautiful. So well done there. Um, Thank you. Since you are a physical therapist, you have a, you know, your doctorate in physical therapy and, and you run a, run a clinic. Um, I'm sure you were very well prepared for your hikes. You, you know, you went and did several, you know, you know, warm up runs and hikes and all that right before, you know, you got there. So you're in perfect shape, right? Oh, but of course not <laughs> at all. I, I do exercise pretty regularly, but we just kind of go do them. And then I can't walk for about four or five days afterwards. So again, I would not recommend doing that. Basically everything that I have done, I would recommend not doing. So it's a lot different to, you know, climb a mountain or hike something high than it is to just be, be working out every day on, you know, on a treadmill or around the neighborhood, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, over Christmas, we decided to hike Mauna Kea while we were in Hawaii. So it's a 13,700 foot mountain and all the people that we met thought we were crazy. There's a road to the top. Why would you hike it? And they're like, oh, we're from Colorado. Like, we'll be fine. And it turned out to be a 17 to 25% grade up a lava sand dune for the first three miles. And then it went, um, then it was about like trails and roads for the last three uphill. And the amount of muscles that you use in your ankles just to stabilize yourself on those uneven surfaces is absolutely crazy. My ankles were the sorest part of my body after that hike. And it really made me notice that flat walking is very different than trail walking, which is very different than a sand dune walk. Um, again, something I probably won't do again, but it was pretty uh, awesome to do. And, but training stability stuff for your ankles and your hips, it's pretty important. And I would definitely recommend it. I've noticed that even the flat parts of the trail are never flat. Like out here in Colorado, you know, it's, there's always like that little incline or that little bend and your ankles are never just flat. So I get these pains from like the little ball on the side of your ankle that runs up towards like the side of it. Is that a common pain or is like, are there certain common pains that people should be expecting? Yeah, I would say so. That's pretty much where I was sore after that. The, um, Hawaii hike and, you know, anything you can do to balance on 
couch cushions or anything like that. If you know, you're going to be walking on pretty uneven surfaces and you're you know, pretty ankles aren't super strong. That would probably be the best way to train them up. And recovery is, is something that is really important and that not everybody spends as much time on. What are some things that you can do if you have, you know, sore muscles in your legs or sore, you know, your ankles are a little bit sore. What, what types of treatment would you recommend after doing a big hike, like a 14 er Um, I mean, we do some yoga after probably the next day, um, day of, if it's possible, um, you know, even taking a hot or cold bat like shower is really nice. Um, keep moving though. Cause your muscles will get really tight and it gets, even more uncomfortable if all you do is sit down afterwards. So going on a small walk the next day, get those, get the blood flowing, get the lactic acid out of your muscles would be ideal. And one of the, one of the problems is a lot of these 14 ers in remote areas or these big hikes or remote areas, you get back in the car and you sit down for two hours and everything stiffens up on you. Um, night of, after a big hike like that, would you suggest like putting ice or heat on, on your legs? I would just keep moving them. I mean, mm-hmm. some people like heat, some people like ice. I don't think there's really anything too bad about either of them. Um, but motion is probably the best bet. You're able to kind of pump all that lactic acid out of your your legs by moving them around. And the more you sit, the stiffer you're going to get. So even just taking a walk around the block would be helpful. Or if it's a long drive back to your house, stopping halfway through getting out, walking around a parking lot for just a little bit, that should help. What about like getting ready beforehand, before that hike? Do you want to make sure that you build yourself up to these heights? Or is it something that, like you said, you did, you work out every day, you just decided to tackle it. If you build up would that reduce some of that soreness? Oh, absolutely. Yep. So even doing, you know, small hikes in the neighborhood or, I mean, I guess in Colorado, we have neighborhood hikes. Um, Mountains are a little bit closer. Um, And then even working on like a Stairmaster or something like that with a weighted um, pack on your back. We've done, I think I was on a 10 inch step with a 25 pound weight in a bag and we did 500 step ups onto it. Again, couldn't really walk the next day, but I think it was pretty helpful to be able to strengthen, especially those uphill muscles. Um, So maybe not start with 500, maybe start with just 150, something like that. Um, That'll help build up those quads, the glutes, the hamstrings, all the important muscles for going on a hike. All righty. And then would you recommend, is stretching or warming up more important when you start that? Like before you go on a hike, I know some people say you stretch. Some people just say do small warm up exercises. Which one would you think would be more important? I am on the small warm up exercise train. Um, I don't think holding stretches right before you go ask your muscles to do such a long um, event is really great for them. They haven't been in that new position. You've just stretched them to yet. And then you ask them to work really hard. Um, so I would say doing kind of a dynamic warm up, doing a couple like air squats, little lunges, heel raises, um, just kind of, again, walking around the parking lot, getting the body to move before you go starting, starting slow, get again, get your muscles working. Right. If you're like us, you'll start early in the morning. So you just got up, sat in a car and started hiking a mountain. So slowly moving around, getting things, getting the blood flowing. I think that's super important and making sure you eat a good breakfast as well. So you're, you're nourished and hydrated before you start even the night. So basically just do the opposite of what you do when you go hiking. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So perfect. Do as I say, not as I do approach. For sure. Um, as a hefty, as a hefty hiker, I like to just, I start slow and then I slow down a little bit and then I finish slow. <laughs> I found that to be perfect. So, um, is there anything else from like a physical uh, standpoint of like trying to make people more comfortable when they're hiked that, that you can think of that will like a good piece of advice to help people out? I think even just if you can take longer walks and use a pack on your back so that your shoulders are used to carrying that amount of weight. Um, I know for myself, sometimes my shoulders are kind of sore after just from holding. I know I have a three liter bladder um, that I put into my bag. So 
plus the food, plus layers, plus new pairs of socks and everything. So getting used to the weight on your back, I think is really important. So start again, starting small, don't start with a whole entire bag full of what you'd bring, but if it's your first time and you've never really gone on a big hike like this, I think it's important to, to try that out. And one thing that I found out, which is really helpful is if you go to, um, REI, they will actually fit your backpack for you, whether you bought it there or not, even if you just take it in there. And one of the most important things is the fit of a backpack, because if you get a backpack and you've got all the weight in the wrong spot, or it's leaning off your shoulders and it doesn't fit right, you're going to have sore muscles in your back and your neck and things are going to be sore. So if you guys are looking to get into starting one of these uh, hikes, make sure you check out REI and get yourself a proper fit and things like that. Plus know what you're bringing. Cause a lot of people bring extra stuff that they don't really need to, um, you know, on some of these hikes. So Kristen, that's some great information. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are you ready for the buffet? This is the rapid fire question round. I'm ready. All right, here we go. Question one, camping, glamping, or staying in a hotel? Ooh, um, depends on my mood, but I, I would say glamping. Glamping. That's, that's mm-hmm. a popular answer. Uh, road trip or fly to your destination? Fly. What is your go-to snack on a trail? Well, at the top is the Summit Snickers every time. And then um, trail mix, Trader Joe's trail mix. The first thing that you eat or drink when you get off the mountain? As much water as possible and some Gatorade. That, see, that's my secret. I keep a cold Gatorade in my car. It's my reward for finishing. And last one, this is the hardest one, forest, mountain, or beach. Where would you rather be right now? Ooh, well, I was at a beach last weekend, so I'm going to say mountain. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, thank you so much. That is the buffet. Um, we have one last segment here, and it's it's. I usually pick out my favorite hike of the week, um, but because you're my guest, I would like to give you the chance to pick out your favorite hike that you've ever done. Go ahead and, and describe it for us if you've got one. Ooh, um, I really liked Sky Pond. I did it with about 10 friends of mine, and you see all sorts of different things, different animals, different parts of nature, and you have beautiful ice colored ponds. They're bright blue and snow on the mountains when we went. So I think that that one was one of my favorite. And then we got some good pizza in Estes Park after. And that's up in Rocky Mountain National Park, right? Yes, it is. I just posted on fatmanlittletrail.com a, a loop. Uh, Sky Pond, you have to scramble or do a little bit of a climb to get to through the waterfall. So I couldn't do that, but I did a loop for those people that can't scramble. And it's six different lakes. You see Dream, a bit, or I'm sorry, you see Nymph, Dream, Emerald, Hayaha, Mills, and Jewel. So that is posted right now on fatmanlittletrail.com if you're interested. Kristen, thank you so much again for joining me. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. And that is going to wrap up this week's podcast. Um, if you have any ideas for future podcasts or feel have any questions or comments on this podcast, feel free to email me at fatmanlittletrails at gmail.com. Um, I do hope to see you all on the trail soon. And until then, happy hiking. <laughs>